Hey guys, what's going on? Megan here. 25 proofs you're not eating enough protein. This is probably going to be the most important video you'll ever see on protein, if not the best video. All right, let's get straight to it. Bodybuilder of the day is Nasser El Sambadi, one of the best bodybuilders of all time, robbed at the 97 Mr. Olympia. Height was 5'11", weight 290. That gave him an RM ratio of 57. And to put that in perspective, guys, Arnold was 37. Uh, his RM was 37, Phil Heath's RM was 41, and obviously the current Mr. Olympia, Brandon Curry, is 46. So Nasser was a beast, very, very underrated, and I feel like he should have had that one Mr. Olympia before his untimely death, you know, rest in peace. But anyway, guys, so back to the topic of this video, protein. I am so sick of the so-called experts telling people that they're not getting, you know, that they're getting enough protein or you don't need to eat a high protein diet, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I got to say about experts, guys. Most of them are wrong. In fact, here's a list of 12 things that I've been preaching on this channel for almost a decade now that experts, so-called experts in course, were wrong on, right? From full body workout to strength, volume, high reps, pump, drive, you name it. They were wrong on almost every single topic. In fact, every, those 12 topics that I put here, they're wrong on it. Why? It's not because I'm smarter, because I'm obviously not. It's just when somebody calls themselves an expert, instantly they're attached with, they're contaminated with expert bias, meaning they refuse to be wrong. So even if they find out that, holy shit, you know, there's new evidence that shows that I'm wrong, they refuse to say it because, they, you know, their ego gets in the way, right? So the moment somebody tells me I'm an expert and I have this many qualifications, I try not to listen to them. In fact, most of the time I just skip it, right? Because they're going to be full of shit, and they're not going to give you the ultimate truth. That's why there's so much bullshit information in the fitness industry. And you got a guy like me who has no degree in fucking, uh, you know, um, all these fucking fancy-ass fitness things. But was literally right on almost every single thing that everyone is preaching now. From full body workouts to frequency to thing. And now this video is going to be on protein, and you'll see, right? It's because I'm not fucking biased. Right? I'm passionate about hypertrophy. I'm passionate about muscle growth. So I pull information from animals, from people from different cultures, different genetics, different sports, and I always look for what they have in common. That's why I'm always ahead of the game. So avoid people that have, one, good genetics. Because again, every, almost everything that they do works. People that are obviously enhanced and people that claim to be experts unless they're humble experts, you know. That's why I love Brad, you know, Brad Schoenfeld because yes, he's an expert, but he's actually humble. He's not afraid to admit that he's wrong, and he's not afraid to literally keep, you know, um, adding to his research and constantly seeking the truth. So be very careful. But anyway, let's go into the first slide. So full body workouts, right? Here's the number one reason why most people are not eating enough protein. So again, when you're doing full body workouts, your body requires more protein, right? And again, I've been you can find you can find all these videos because I've been talking about this for years. Right, and at the time, I didn't have to have a study to back that up. I, I I told you guys using common sense. If you're just training chest or you're just training tri triceps, you're doing a typical split routine. How much protein do you actually need? Not as much, right? Because your your protein sensitive response is not as elevated because you're only stimulating a small percentage of your body. But when you're training full body or high frequency or very high volume, your protein requirement goes up. That people were saying, well, there's no, you know, there's no study to back this out. This is bro science, this and this and this and that. And sure enough, right? Uh, I think it was, yeah, there it goes, McNaughton, right? Made a study recently showing that, holy shit, you know, because back then we used to think 20 grams was enough to max out more protein synthesis, 20 grams per, per, per meal. And now we find out, no, if you do full body workouts, you actually need double that amount. Bam, 40 grams of protein in that study. And that was regardless of body weight, right? Which makes fucking sense, guys. Did you need a study to tell you this? I was telling you guys this for years. It's just common sense. If you're going to the gym and you're training chest, back, triceps, you know, shoulders, like like all these body parts, quads, hamstrings, in one day, there's no way in hell you should be eating the same amount of protein as the average person. Next, IGF-1, right? Very protein. In fact, I'm going to start going a lot faster because the video's already at four minutes. Actually, it's way more than four minutes. Um, so protein sensitive, right? So IGF-1 which is, again, one of the most anabolic peptides in the body, is protein-sensitive. In fact, when people have cancer, right, they actually advise to lower their protein intake because it's a strong correlation with IGF-1, right? But when you're trying to put on gains, you want to maximize, you know, your insulin-like growth factor 1, 
And of course, IGF-1, I, I talk about in every video, is responsible for protein synthesis, you know, activating mTOR, activating satellite cells, increasing your strength, lowering myostatin, you are increasing your androgen receptor activity, bone density, you name it, right? IGF-1 is responsible for so many things, and it's very, very sensitive to your protein intake, right? So that's one reason why I recommend very high protein intakes, you know, except, again, there are some exceptions where, I, where I'm okay with giving somebody, I won't say low, but moderate protein. And that exception is usually when somebody is extremely skinny and they want to put on a lot of mass fast and I'm trying to increase their carbs. Yeah, in that case, I might put them on a little bit on the on, on, the, on the lower side of protein so they can have more room for carbohydrates. Um, but other than that, in fact, even in that situation, they're still eating more protein than the average person. Next, you know, it minimizes muscle damage, right? Problem with too much muscle damage. Yes, obviously you want some kind of muscle damage when you're training, but not too much. Right, because too much muscle damage obviously means it takes longer for your body to recover. Longer for your body to recover means it takes longer for you to actually maximize your weekly volume. Right? If you train on Monday, you cause too much damage. Guess what? You can't go back on Tuesday or Wednesday and train again, at least not efficiently. Right? Well, high protein diet speeds up recovery, which is coming up soon, right? But it minimizes the muscle damage, mainly through, I'm not going to go into the, the boring science, but mainly to taurine, carnitine, alginine, things like that, right? A lot of the amino acids really help, uh, you know, they have antioxidant properties and it really help minimize muscle damage. But if you're not eating enough protein or if you're on the low side, you're not getting those benefits, right? Remember, volume is the number one drive for hypertrophy, you know, weekly volume, of course. And the best way to increase that is through frequency. That's why I'm so big on higher frequency. But excessive damage, I should say, blunts that, right? Next, muscle protein synthesis is lower in trained men. That's a fact. Everyone knows this by now, right? And of course, the consensus is 1.6 grams uh, per kilogram of, of, of body weight. And of course, we're finding out that that's not enough. In fact, there's a study by Missoula, right, which is actually showing that trained men actually need more protein. In fact, trained men who are also used to eating, you know, normal protein intakes or higher protein intakes, they actually need more protein to maximize protein synthesis, right? And that came to the conclusion of about two grams uh, of protein per kilogram of body weight, right? And I actually recommend way more than that, but and I'm, I'm going to show you exactly why. Next, strength for performance, right? Taurine, you're going to hear me mention about taurine and glutamine. You know, I've mentioned them in almost every video, right? Very, very, very crucial for maximizing strength and performance. Now, instead of supplementing with it, how about you just increase your protein intake? So, strength and performance, you know, is obviously going to be affected by your by your protein intake. You don't believe me? Go on a low protein diet and see what happens to your strength and performance, right? So, you want to have you know more strength gains, better performance in the gym. It is paramount that your protein intake is not you know lacking. Next, protein synthesis and mTOR. Out of all the BCAAs, out of all the, the amino acids, leucine is the most powerful at stimulating mTOR, which is the main enzyme responsible for protein synthesis, aka muscle building. And that's pretty much how steroids work, right? One of the pathways of steroids work is, and keeps protein synthesis elevated all the time. As a natty, it is paramount that you actually optimize your leucine intake, which is going to come from your diet, right? There's no need to supplement with leucine. Get that shit from your diet. Next, recovery. Protein plays a huge role in recovery. Glycogen replenishment, mainly through glutamine and taurine, right? Antioxidant properties, toxin removal, food digestion, your gut health. I have some slides on that coming up, your immune system, right? And you guys know, if you see me in the comment section, I'm always talking about recovery. Recovery, recovery, recovery. Almost every question you ask me, you're going to see me mention recovery, right? I, I always say it depends on your recovery management. It depends on your recovery management. Well, guess what? Protein is one big factor of your ability to recover. On top of sleep and water and the, the, the usual basic things that I talk about. Next, old people. Old people have a blunted response to protein synthesis. So, so since, again, studies are backing this up as well. They need higher protein intakes just to, you know, just to literally have the same amount of protein synthesis that young people do. So as you age, that's another reason why you need to increase your protein intake. Next, testosterone, the king of anabolic hormones. Right again, your androgen receptor, which is what testosterone has to bind to, actually, you know, to actually have its effect, most of its effects, is the number one predictor of muscle gains. Meaning, before we even put you on a workout program, your androgen receptor content is what lets anyone know ahead of time how you'll respond to that training. Again, that's why nuclear cell load is so important. I'm trying to have you guys maximize the amount of nuclei within your muscle because, again, the more nuclei, the more androgen receptors. That's also what happens when you take steroids. They increase your nuclei, which obviously increases your androgen receptors. But guess what? Testosterone is also affected by protein intake. 
through, through direct mechanisms and also indirect mechanisms. You know, through IGF-1 production, carnitine, cortisol, growth hormone, you know, just, and also having a high caloric uh, intake, which is coming up soon. Because protein allows you to have a high caloric intake, even, even when you're going on the cut. Next, cortisol, right? Cortisol lowered by protein. You guys know by now, everyone knows what the fuck cortisol does, right? Having a high protein diet help you lower cortisol. Taurine, there was an effect on the GABA receptor. You have glutamine. You know, I made a long ass video on glutamine. You can look that up. The antioxidant properties, you know, the liver detox effects of protein, all of those things. And again, of course, the whole, you know, the fact that protein allows you to eat, you know, to get away with higher calories. All of these things play a role in lowering cortisol. X myostatin, which is the number one muscle killer, right? Well, guess what? Protein intake helps lower myostatin. Higher protein intake means you're also getting more glutamine. You're also getting more taurine, right? which again are very powerful at lowering myostatin. You're getting more leucine, as I mentioned earlier, which is going to increase mTOR, which is one of the things that myostatin fucks up. And of course, the testosterone and growth hormone IGF-1 effects of protein is, is actually going to help lower myostatin as well. Next, pump maximization, right? Don't, don't worry, guys. That video on the pump is coming up. I'm going to make another one, right? Again, the pump, yes, the pump you get from training is a better predictor of hypertrophy than your extra strength gains. And by now, if you watch my videos, you already know this by now, right? I'm so sick of people who kept spitting out shitty advice for years, telling people, oh, you need to work, you need to increase your absolute strength if you want to put on muscle and this and that. It's, it's, it's part of my bullshit, bullshit, right? And now the literature is undivided when it comes to that. It was one of the biggest myths in the fitness industry. And some people still preach that bullshit, right? But anyway, watch my video on... Um, I'm going to put it in the description or up there on this slide. Destroying that myth to the fucking ground. But anyway, yeah. So the pump is actually a better predictor of how much muscle you would build from the workout. Now, obviously, everything has to be aligned, right? You know, enough volume, enough frequency, obviously enough weight and things like that. But do not underestimate the importance of the pump. And guess what? Yes, protein helps with the pump. How? Again, through the top two, right? Glutamine and taurine. They put water into the cell. I think I mentioned that in, uh, in the water video or the high rep video. Or, no, I think it was the coronavirus video. But anyway, I mentioned that several times, right? Creatine itself, even, again, think about creatine. One of the number one functions of creatine, apart from its effects on strength and myostatin and all that stuff, is it's an osmolite. It pulls water into the cell, right? And guess what? Creatine is made from arginine, which is non-essential, in some cases essential, and obviously methionine, which is, which is an essential amino acid. So you can't just rely on your body to, you know, synthesize that if you're deficient on protein. Next, growth hormone through arginine, right? Growth hormone, everyone knows by now what HGH does, right? It's protein sensitive, right? Arginine increases growth hormone. Protein deficiency in kids, think, think about that. Kids that grow up with low protein diets, especially in poor countries like some places in India, some parts of Africa and things like that, they end up being short as fuck, right? They have growth hormone deficiencies mainly linked to nutritional status and protein intake, All right? So growth hormone is sensitive to your protein intake, just like IGF-1, right? Because again, growth hormone is critical for the production of IGF-1, systemic IGF-1. And of course, it's going to help you with strength recovery, bone density, losing fat, all that stuff, right? Next, the nitrogen natty curse. Remember, guys, I mean, look at the difference here of when um, uh, Nasser was natty, Compared to when he, you know, hopped on the juice. Night and day, right? But guess what? Us natties, we have to deal with the natty curse. So what is it? Nitrogen retention, right? Our body's constantly trying to break down protein. When you natty, you constantly fighting your body's... You understand? Your body does not want to be sore. That's why it has myostatin. It does not want to be too sore because, again, it burns too many calories, right? And it's not efficient from a survival standpoint unless you obviously have a lot of food. So the body's always trying to keep you... Obviously, the body wants you to have some kind of muscle mass, but just enough for you to get by. That's why it only builds muscle when you're either in a surplus. Of course, you can put on muscle in a deficit, but again, that's a topic for a whole different video. you know. But mainly, it, it only maximizes muscle growth when you're either in a surplus or when you expose it to extreme mechanical stress. There's a reason for that. Your body does not like to put on muscle. And as the natty, you're constantly fighting this this battle. Your body's constantly trying to break down protein. The nitrogen natty curse is very hard for us to be in a positive nitrogen balance. And guess what? Protein prevents nitrogen loss. The more protein you eat or the more calories you eat, 
the less nitrogen your body ex excretes, right? And I, and I mentioned a three gram rule, right? For you to put on a pound of muscle a month, your body needs to synthesize three grams of new protein a day. Right? I made a video about that about two, three, no, actually about four years ago. Look that up, right? So your body only needs to synthesize three grams of new protein a day for you to put on a pound of muscle a month. Yet, the average person is way more than just, you know, 100, 150 grams of protein. So where's all that protein going? Most of it is being oxidized, right? Your body's burning that shit. Your body does not want to retain nitrogen, you know, once you're an adult. So having a higher protein intake is going to help mitigate that nitrogen loss. That's why people that are on steroids, right, don't, they can actually get away with, I won't say low protein intake, but, you know, with, with, a, with a medium or moderate protein intake because the body, you know, one of the functions of steroids is obviously increased nitrogen retention. But we're not on the juice, you natties. Next, gorillas, right? And that's one of the things that I hate hearing the most. People say, oh, well, look at gorillas. They're so big and muscular. You know, they don't eat that much protein. Who the fuck said that? And you guys understand. You guys know me. I love animals, right? I'm always studying weird ass animals, lions, gorillas, whatever. In fact, I use gorilla emojis on almost every, you know every video. My it used to be my background at one point. I love studying nature because in fact that's why I get a lot of my knowledge and wisdom from just studying nature. And who the hell came up with the myth that gorillas don't eat enough protein? Gorillas eat a fuck ton of protein. In fact, keep in mind, gorillas can weigh up to 450 pounds, depending on what species, lowland, mountain gorillas, whatever. But they can weigh up to 450 pounds. The silverback, of course, right? The biggest motherfucker. They eat up to 8,000 calories, in some cases even more. And guess what? Most of those calories is actually protein. If they could choose, gorillas actually prefer the plants and, you know, the, the vegetation, whatever, that's actually higher in protein intake. So throughout the year, the diet is usually between 17 up to 30% protein. That gives you about 350 to 600 grams of protein. And most of the time, they actually prefer the high end, which is, again, that would be 600 grams of protein in one day for your average 400 plus pound gorilla. That's insane. Guys. That's that's more than one gram per pound of body weight. So where did that myth come from that you don't need a lot of protein? Because look at gorillas, they just eat. So don't get it twisted. Gorillas get a lot of protein in and it's the same for other muscular animals. Yes, I went as far years ago and studied the most muscular animals. You know, lions, tigers, horses. And guess what? They also eat at least one gram per pound of body when it comes to protein. Next, let's look at the fat loss effects of protein. The direct effects is again through... I gotta hurry up now because this video is long as fuck. The direct effects is obviously through carnitine, increasing your metabolism, lowering your appetite. You know, and again, the indirect effects is through your hormones, right? But like I mentioned earlier, growth hormones, testosterone, and all that stuff, um, helping you recover, which obviously is going to increase your need and you eat. Because again, when you, you know, not recover from the gym, you don't want to move, you want to lay down all day. So believe it or not, that actually makes you fatter because you're no longer in the energy deficit, right? People end up being in a surplus when they don't recover well, simply because when you're not recovered well, you move less, right? These are things that people don't think about. Protein helps with that, right? And the most powerful effect, again, is on your metabolism. The fact that protein has such a high fucking thermic effect, right? Your appetite. Protein lowers your appetite. Everyone knows this, right? Keeps you full longer, lowers ghrelin, right? So why not have a high protein intake, especially if you're fat and struggle with, you know, obesity and eating all day long and things like that. Next, keeps your calories high while you're cutting. To me, that's one of the biggest benefits of a high protein diet is you can cut on high ass calories. I have my clients on calories that will make you think, wait, how are they losing weight with their calories so damn high? Because their protein is high as shit, right? Remember, guys, and I, told, I made a video about that study, right? The study about, I think it was about Jose Antonio, where uh, they fat people on the surplus. And they give them 800 extra calories. These were trained men. 800 extra calories. And based on the, you know, uh, more calories, they're just going to get fat. No, nope, they actually lost fat and retained lean mass. So they put on more lean mass, even though they had 800 more calories and did not get fat at all. And that's not just one isolated study. There are several studies on that. Look that up, guys. Most studies that where people are overfat protein, even if they put on weight, they put on less fat than the other group. And they regain, maintain, or actually, you know, put on more muscle. Right? That's why protein is the most important macro for body composition. So many overfeeding studies have the exact same conclusion. So people, so when you're actually cutting, instead of having your calories low as shit, which I'm always against, right? Because it fucks up your metabolism long term, right? Having a high-ass protein intake allows you to eat slightly more. I mean, think about it. When you can eat up to 800 more calories and not get and not get fat at all, that's insane. 
But yet, if you lower your, your calories too much or lower your protein too much, well, guess what? Now you got to put up with, uh, you know, lower T3, higher cortisol, you know, and all that bullshit. Next, thermic threat of protein is about 20%. Meaning, if you're eating 1,000 calories just from protein, your body's going to burn roughly 200 calories just to process that. That is huge, guys. Which is one of the reasons why I would say you can't just tell people the calories are calorie. Because, yes, technically it is. But the moment that goes inside your body, the way it's processed changes the game. And protein, yes, even though it has the same calorie as one gram of carbs, right? Your body processes the protein differently. So that's why it is better to be in a surplus from protein than to be in a surplus from carbs or fats, right? So just think about it. 1,000 calories from protein, your body is going to burn about 200 calories just to process that. Do you know what 200 calories are? God, this is one fucking hour on a treadmill. You know how boring it is to just walk on a treadmill for one hour? That's the equivalent of 50 grams of carbs. That's like a bowl of pasta or rice, guys. Cannot underestimate the power of protein. Liver, you know, health detox. Again, that's another thing I made a video on. I'm not going to go into the details. Look it up. Your liver is your largest organ, right? It weighs more than your brain. It's one of your... In fact, I don't want to say the most important organ because you have it in your brain and your heart, but it's literally up there, right? And it's also the most energy costly, right? For a reason. It does way too many things. And protein is essential for keeping a healthy liver, Right? If you forgot the role of the liver, again, it sends glucose to the brain, stores vitamins and minerals. That's why a lot of uh, indigenous populations like to, like to uh, eat the liver when they kill an animal because it's a storehouse of vitamins and minerals. Uh, it creates non-essential amino acids, helps you with digestion, produ you know, production of hormones through cholesterol, your immune system, blah, 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 blah. The liver does so many fucking things. Then again, watch my video on liver and liver detox and things like that. And guess what? The number one source of fuel for your liver is amino acids, protein. Next, it's perfect for body composition, like I mentioned earlier, maintaining muscle, losing fat. Next, non-essential amino acids, because I hear a lot of people say, well, you don't need a lot of protein because, you know, uh, uh, only a few are essential. The other ones are non-essential. But guess what? The majority of the non-essential amino acids, especially the important ones, are made from essential amino acids. So really, I, I, I hate the term non-essential because... How can something be non-essential if you need an essential amino acid to fucking make it? But again, again, that's a whole different topic, right? Example, carnitine is made from lysine, which is essential. Taurine is made from methionine, which is essential. Tyrosine, made from phenylalanine. I spelled it wrong, by the way. You know, cysteine, made from methionine. Tyrosine, like all of these things are made from essential amino acids. Next, motivation. Dopamine, guys, helps you with appetite control, helps you with motivation. Right? It's the main neurotransmitter involved in you know keeping you motivated. And when your dopamine levels are low, what happens? You're demotivated, you don't want to do anything, you you know, you have low energy because dopamine obviously converts to adrenaline, so they'll you know they all play similar roles, right? That's why most drugs are dopamine agonists, right? Cocaine blocks the reabsorption of um dopamine. That's why people that take cocaine, you know, they can work for longer hours, they're full of energy, they're super motivated. You know, a lot of believe it or not, a lot of lawyers and people in high finance abuse cocaine for that very purpose. And of course, I don't fucking recommend it. But I'm just letting you guys know the mechanism of action. You know, same thing, meth, you no? Know? Caffeine. All of these things increase dopamine and give you this feeling of, okay, I'm ready to conquer the world. But guess what? Dopamine is made from fucking tyrosine. That's obviously made from phenylalanine, right? So again, it all comes back to protein, guys. Protein is so fucking essential. Next, digestion in your gut. And I always emphasize digestion because all of the food that you're eating means absolute jack shit if your body cannot digest and absorb it, right? And guess what? Your gut is sensitive to protein, right? In fact, the number one fuel for your gut is what? Glutamine. And finally, the 240 rule, right? That's the one rule that I go over with my clients all the time, right? The body can only absorb, well, m according to most studies, it's about 8 to 10 grams of protein per hour. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that if your body is absorbing protein every single hour, which obviously, you know, the body doesn't work like that, but if it did, you know, theoretically speaking, that's 240 grams a day, right? 24 hours in a day. So that tells you that based on the body's capacity to process and absorb protein, higher protein intakes are actually required. Right? Because why would the body have enough amino acid transporters and things like that to process up to 10 grams per hour if it's not ready to take in that amount? Right? Now, of course, some of it is going to be oxidized. Some of it is going to be used for glucose and things like that. But that's besides the point. 
right? So that's why, believe it or not, I recommend high-ass protein intakes. Of course, you know, I tell them, check with your doctor, make sure you have no kidney issues and things like that. But because there are more rewards than risks when it comes to eating protein, right? And to so conclusion, the benefits of higher protein intake are endless, right? Gains in strength, fat loss, energy, mental uh, health, appetite, recovery, bone density, digestion, stress, all these, all these things I just mentioned, vitamins and minerals, removing toxins and things like that, right? So many benefits of a higher protein diet. And what are the risks? They are very fucking small. You know, I'm, I'm always looking at risk to reward ratio, right? Every time I make a decision, right? Because that's the pit. That's that's literally the centerpiece of trading. You know, whether you're trading stocks, or you're trading uh, different instruments, you always have to focus on risk reward. So I use that same mindset for training and everything else. Look at the rewards of a high protein diet and look at the risks, right? Kidney again. That's only if you already have kidney issues, right? Studies have been done on that. If your kidneys are fine, you should be good. Right, and that's why I always tell people, hey, check with your doctor. Check with your doctor. I'm not a fucking doctor. Check with your doctor. As long as you, as long as he approves it, you're good to go. Right. Other risk is it's not really a risk, but it's expensive for shit. Right. Protein is expensive. Right. But so is being a fat ass. Right. So is being out of shape. Next, taste. You know, I really don't like the taste of lean meats. Right. Because again, if you have a high protein diet, you kind of want to, you know, keep your fats low so you can make room for your carbohydrates and your macros. And most people, myself included, uh, hate the taste of lean meats, you know. But, again, that's a small price to pay. And obviously your poops, right? If you're not getting enough fiber and water, high-protein diet is going to destroy you in the bathroom, warning you right now, right? And, of course, like I said, if you're too skinny, then you might want to, you know, go on a, I don't want to say low end, but the moderate moderate end of uh, protein intake because you want to make room for carbs, right? You know, I, I always say that when you're skinny, extremely skinny, carbs is actually more important, right? Because it's going to keep you hungry, you're going to keep eating, you're going to get your calories in, um, and obviously it's, it's going to spare, uh, you know, a protein breakdown. Because again, the more the more carbs you eat, the higher your calories are, the less protein you need. Right? And obviously the cancer risk, but again, guys, I don't even give, I, I don't give a shit to be honest, because so many fucking things give you cancer, right? Right? Right and 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 it's not it's not as fucking crazy as people make it out to be. Everyone thinks, oh, if you eat high protein, you know, you're gonna have cancer like the next day. That's not how the body works. All right, guys. So hopefully, this video smashes all the myths on protein that are out there. Eat a high protein diet as long as your doctor approves it, as long as your kidneys are fine, as long as you're not too broke, and you can actually afford it. There are way more benefits than risks when it comes to eating high protein. In fact, most people. Most people are not eating enough protein, simply based on all the factors that I just mentioned, right? And the recommendations vary. Like I said, you know, every client I have has different macros. You know, it depends on so many things, but rarely do I put someone on less than 200 grams of protein, unless it's obviously a woman that's obviously, you know, has, has a shorter stature. So the only people that actually have eating less than 200 grams of protein are women because, again, they have, you know, their body mass is significantly lower. But if you're a dude, there's no reason why you shouldn't be on at least, at least one grams per pound of body weight. And that's at least, right? Now, of course, if you're super, super, super obese, I'm going to have to make some adjustments because, again, you got to factor in the fact that your, you know, your fat mass um, um, is not as metabolically active as your muscle mass. But, again, that's for a whole separate video. For most people, you will benefit from a higher protein intake. But, all right, guys. Like the button, subscribe and hit the bell. Buy my ebook and training program on the website. It's the all in one hypertrophy guide, meal plan, macro guide, nutrition guide. So check out the site, grab it, use the 40% off code, Nucleus Overload.